Hello class, this is Dr. Lyons, and what we're going to talk about in this chapter is animals. Uh, so this is one of my favorite chapters because I find animals pretty fascinating. They're pretty cool, pretty diverse group of living things on the planet, and a lot of them do some pretty neat stuff. Uh, and a lot of them are very pretty. So for instance, what you're seeing here is a picture of a soft coral, what's known as a gorgonian. Uh, this is a picture I took in Indonesia a few years ago. So first what we're going to do is we're going to start with general characteristics of animals. Right, so, so there's probably a few things we think of when we're, when we're thinking about animals or, or how we might distinguish between an animal and say a plant or a fungus. So some of those characteristics, uh, oh, don't worry about that. Some of those characteristics include being eukaryotic, right? So that means that they have a, have a, uh, a, a, a cell with a nucleus, right? So like, like, uh, so the same as like plants and fungi. So animals are also eukaryotic. Uh, all animals are multicellular, right? So we're all made of more than one cell, you know, as opposed to things like, like, uh, like prokaryotes or certain types of protists. We're all heterotrophic, meaning that we have to eat uh, other things, right? So we, we can't photosynthesize, we can't chemosynthesize. Uh, we need to actually ingest food that has stored energy in it. Uh, our cells don't have cell walls, right? So this is what distinguishes us from plants, for instance. So we have a plasma cell membrane around all of our cells, uh, but we don't have a, a hard cell wall. Uh, and the very simple reason for that is that animals, you know, we, we all have different types of, of not necessarily skeletal systems, but we all have support systems, right? Some of us do have skeletal systems. Others have shells. You know, some have hard external skeletons. Uh, but either way, we have rigid structures. Uh, so we don't need to have hard cell walls like plants need to have hard cell walls because they don't have any other hard parts in their bodies. Uh, all animals move at some point, right? This is a key distinguishing feature uh, that makes us different from other types of living things, right? So we move at some part in our life cycle. Uh, that doesn't necess necessarily mean that we move in all parts of our life cycle, but we move at some point in our life cycle, right? So things like us, like mammals, we pretty much move throughout our whole lives, right? Even when we're, you know, in, in the womb before we're born, we're moving around in there. Uh, but there are some animals that uh, that they will move at some point and then stop moving. So things like corals, for instance, you know, when they are very small, when they're very young, they will swim around in the water until they find a place on the seafloor that they want to live. Uh, and then they will attach to the seafloor and spend the rest of their life in that very exact spot. So they move at one point of their life, but not during their entire life. Uh, and finally, all animals do something like ingestion. You know, this is kind of related to us being heterotrophs. So we have to actually consume food uh, because how we, we power our bodies is with energy that is stored within our foods uh, because we can't photosynthesize and we can't chemosynthesize. Okay, so first let's talk about where the animals came from. So... Uh, animals as a group, we go back about 575 million years. Uh, that's when the first animals first showed up on, on the planet, right? So not too long after the first multicellular life showed up on the planet, animals showed up uh, pretty soon after that. Uh, our ancestors are protists, right? So protists, as we were talking about uh, two chapters ago, a uh, very important group of organisms because the protists uh, from them evolved the animals, the plants, and the fungi all evolved from protists. Uh, so protists are very important. So a really key part of the, the, the life of, or the, the history of animals on our planet uh, is a period known as the Cambrian explosion. So the Cambrian was a, was a period uh, in, in, you know, in our planet. Uh, you know, is it a time period in our planet, you know, like the like the Triassic or the Holocene or the Eocene or all the other periods of time in our planet. Uh, and the Cambrian was uh, a period between 535 and 525 million years ago. Uh, and it's during that time that animal diversity increased very, very rapidly. Right. So in the first, you know, 10, 20 million years that animals were around, there wasn't a whole lot of them. Uh, but during this 10 million 
year time period during the Cambrian explosion, that's when animals really took off. Uh, and suddenly there, there went from being very few animals to being lots of different types of animals. Uh, this is a cartoon of what that what the ocean might have looked like during the Cambrian uh, period. Uh, a lot of the same animals that you see here still exist today. You have, so like sponges or these green sort of cactus looking things. You know, this is an ancient sort of like insect sort of thing. Uh, this is a sort of ancient looking coral. This is like an ancient looking worm, you know, jellyfish. Uh, I don't know what the hell that is. Uh, so all these these things uh, have uh, all these things that occurred a long time ago now have descendants that occur today. Uh, a particular fossil that you find a lot of uh, from this time period is this cute little thing. So this is what's known as a trilobite. Uh, and this is an ancestor of, of things like crabs and lobsters and insects. Uh, and I include this map up here, uh, this, this place where the, the A is, uh, that's what's known as the Burgess uh, Shale. And that's where a lot of the, the fossils from the Cambrian time period uh, came from. Okay, so that's where, that's where animals come from. Okay, let's talk a little bit about how we distinguish between different types of animals. Uh, so one way that we can distinguish is whether or not an animal has any tissues. So a tissue is a group of cells that are similar, that are performing some similar function to the rest of the cells around them. So for instance, muscle is tissue. Right? So if you think of, a, of any muscle in your body, it is made up of individual cells that are similar, that are all performing the function of, of contracting and pulling things together. So, so tissues are a really important part of, of the lives of certain animals, right? So there are some animals that don't have tissues, uh, such as this uh, vase sponge over here. Uh, and then there are some animals that do have tissues, such as this coral uh, over here, or my wife over here, right? So corals and wives, or, you know, humans in general, we have tissues, whereas things like sponges do not have, uh, do not have tissues. Another way that we can distinguish between different types of animals is the type of, of symmetry that they have. So there's kind of three different types of symmetry. There, there are organisms that are radial, organisms that are bilateral, and organisms that don't have any type of symmetry. Right? Animals that don't have any symmetry, uh, we typically call them uh, asymmetrical, so meaning having no symmetry, or we call them uh, irregular with their symmetry. So things that are radial uh, tend to be kind of circular shaped. So think of a radius is part of a circle. You know, so a radius is the uh, is the distance between the perimeter of a circle and the in, in the center part of a, of a circle. Uh, and so radius, you know, refers to circular things and th animals that are radial are kind of circular, like this anemone here. So the thing that makes a, an animal radial is it's got a central kind of point or line, you know, running through it, and everything kind of originates from that central point, right? So everything kind of comes out of that, that centralized point of that, that animal. So like this anemone here, for instance, it's a, it's a radial organism. Uh, or if we were to think of an inanimate object that is radial, uh, a potting plant that you would, you know, pot, that you would grow whatever uh, inside of is radial. So that's in contrast with animals that are bilateral. So the prefix bi means two, and in the, in the suffix lateral means sides. So bilateral animals have two sides, right? So they have a left side and they have a right side. Uh, so this lobster is bilateral. Right, so it's, it's, it's got a left side that is a mirror image of the right side. So that's kind of a key thing, is that the two sides are, are mirror images of, of each other. Uh, and if you think of us humans, for instance, we are bilateral, right? You have a left side and you have a right side. Or, or an inanimate object that is bilateral would be like a, a shovel, right, that has a left side and a right side. So, of course, there can be some confusion between these two things because you could look at an anemone and say, OK, it's got a left side over here and it's got a right side uh, over here. Where, so where we can truly distinguish between radial and bilateral organisms uh, is that with a radial organism, it has many left and right sides. Right. So it has you can cut a radial organism up many ways and have mirror images. 
right? So if you could, you could cut it like this way and this side and this side are mirrors, you could cut it this way, like along this blue line, and then you'd have this side and this side are mirrors. Basically, you can cut it a lot of different ways and have mirror imaged left sides and right sides. But with a truly bilateral organism, there's only one way, you know, to split it up to have mirror images, right? You can only split up a lobster in this particular way so that it has a mirror image left and right side. If you were to cut it, you know, say down the middle, uh, it would have a front half and a back half that are not mirror images to each other. Or if you were to cut it like this so that there was a top and a bottom, again, it wouldn't be a mirror image. Uh, they would be different from each other. So bilateral organisms have just one true left and right side. Okay, a little bit about how the animal groups are related to each other. Uh, and so these are the groups that we're going to go through. Uh, in part A of this chapter, we're going to go up to the, uh, we're going to go up to the, the uh, I guess the annelids. Uh, and then in the part B of this chapter, we'll go through the rest of these groups, the roundworms through the chordates. Okay. Uh, and some of the key things that we just talked about, the key ways that we, that we distinguish between the different animals is whether or not there are tissues, right? So, so tissues evolve somewhere along here. So all of these things all have tissues because their ancestors had tissues, whereas these sponges, they don't have tissues. Uh, and then of the, the animals that have tissues, there's kind of two major breaks, right? So there are the things that are radial in symmetry. So that's one major group of the, of the tissued uh, animals. And then there are those that have bilateral symmetry. Uh, you may be looking down here and saying, hey, this sea star sure looks like it has radial symmetry. Uh, sea stars are kind of a weird group uh, amongst the bilateral organisms in that they are bilateral when they're juveniles, but then they metamorphose into radial organisms. So they, they are, they're more truly bilateral organisms, uh, and they're more closely related to this group of animals than this group, than the cnidarians. So uh, one key thing that I want to kind of point out here uh, is, is where backbones come into play here. So when we think of animals, most of us tend to think of animals that are similar to us. You know, things like dogs and cats and horses and bears and squirrels and chipmunks, right? We tend to think of things that are similar to us. So we tend to think of animals uh, as things that have backbones. But in fact, the vast majority of animals do not have backbones, right? All of these groups are things that do not have a backbone. And by backbone, I mean a vertebral column. You know, I mean, I mean your spine. So like those, those hard vertebrae that, that you can feel along your back, that is your backbone. And you have one of those, whereas all of these things, sponges all the way through the echinoderms, none of these things have a backbone. It's only this one group of animals. Uh, in fact, it's only one part of this one group of chordates that actually do have a backbone. So we are actually, the, the, in, in terms of, of animals and in terms of backbones, uh, us things that have backbones, we are definitely the minority amongst the animals. Uh, the vast majority of animals do not have a backbone. Uh, we are kind of the, the weird ones of the, of the animals. So we're going to kind of go through those, those different groups. Uh, we're not going to go into great detail in any, in any one of them, uh, but we'll kind of, I'll kind of give you some key features of each of the different groups. Uh, so the first group I want to talk about are the sponges or the phylum periphera. Uh, so in terms of SpongeBob characters, this is obviously what SpongeBob is. These are what sponges actually look like. Well, they, they don't look like this, that's a fish. But this stuff here, that's what's called a rope sponge, and this is what's called a lavender uh, uh, vase uh, sponge. Uh, and sponges uh, are kind of characterized by being the simplest of the animals, right? So they, they are tr very, very simple animals on the, on the whole, right? So, so they, they're attached to the seafloor, right? So that's kind of simple. You know, they, they swim around when they're juveniles, but when they're adults, they're attached to the seafloor and don't go anywhere. Uh, they don't have any true tissues like us, right? So they don't have uh, muscle tissue. They don't have nerves. They don't have a brain. You know, they don't have a digestive tract. You know, they have uh, just very, very simple uh, bodies, right? They don't have any sort of defined uh, symmetry. 
you might look at this sponge and think, oh, it looks maybe kind of radial. Uh, but in fact, sponges as a whole, they typically just kind of take whatever shape the seafloor has that they're growing on top of. Right. So if the seafloor, you know, is kind of kind of rocky shaped, then a sponge is going to look just kind of rocky because uh, it just takes the shape of the seafloor. Uh, I have personally seen sponges that are the shapes of propellers from, you know, a sponge that was growing on top of the propeller of a shipwreck. Uh, and I've seen sponges that, you know, that look like a porthole on a boat because they were just happened to be growing over the porthole of a boat. Right. So sponges just take whatever shape the seafloor is. So they, they themselves don't have a, a true uh, symmetry. Uh, and, and kind of the, the thing that sponges do the most uh, is they filter water to feed. Uh, so we, we think of when we think of animals feeding, we tend to think of animals as being either carnivores or herbivores. Right. So eating whole large things, whole large plants or whole large animals. But there's actually quite a few animals that eat small particles uh, and sponges are one of them. So what sponges do is they suck in water through their sides. Uh, they use these particular cells you know what, uh, known as coenocytes to do that. Uh, in these little cells, uh, this little thing, uh, this little kind of triangle shaped thing that you see on them, those are kind of these sticky hair like things. Uh, and what they do is they suck water in through their sides. Uh, water passes over these sticky kind of hair like things uh, and small bits of food that are drifting in the water will get trapped by those hair like things. Then the water is then shot back up through the top. Uh, and how they actually get water moving through their, their bodies uh, is that these little feeding cells, you see the, how they have these little purple things coming out of them. Uh, those are flagella. Uh, and what those flagella do is just by kind of whipping back and forth, which is what flagella do, they create uh, water movement. Uh, so water gets sucked in through the side and out through the top. Uh, and the water that goes in has food particles in it. The water that goes out the top is cleaned of food particles. So sponges are actually really important in the ecosystems that they live in because they clean the water. They're like little natural water filters uh, for the environments that they live in. Again, the next group of, of animals that I want to talk about are the cnidarians. So now we have moved from the very, very simple uh, sponges that don't have tissues and don't have any symmetry uh, to the cnidarians, which have tissues and have symmetry. Uh, and cnidarians include things like anemones, which you see here. They include jellyfishes uh, and they include corals, uh, such as this coral here. So cnidarians, uh, how they're characterized uh, is by being radial in their symmetry and by having tissues. So if you look at this jellyfish, for instance, you know, it's got, if you were to look at, look at it from the top, it would look like a circle and there would be one center point and everything kind of goes, originates out from that central point. Or if you look here, this is a, um, this is a, uh, a close up view of what a coral looks like. Uh, and, and this is what's known as one individual coral polyp. Uh, and you can see this kind of a central thing, central point, and everything radiates out from that. So cnidarians are radial and cnidarians have actual tissue, right? So they have things kind of like muscles, they have digestive tissue, they have nerves, you know, they, they can't necessarily think, but they do have a nervous system, right? So they have tissues like we do. Uh, and there's kind of two body forms, two body shapes that cnidarians come in. So there's what's known as the polyp form. Uh, that's what you see here. Uh, a polyp is sessile, meaning it's stuck to the sea floor uh, and its tentacles are facing upward uh, and, so, and its mouth is facing upward. Uh, and they essentially eat things that drift by, that drift to them. Whereas then the Medusa stage is mobile. Uh, and so it moves around uh, and its tentacles and mouth are facing downward. Uh, and so this jellyfish has the Medusa form. And so in general, it's the Medusa form that you want to watch out for. This is the one that, that can actually sting you, which is why it's called a Medusa. So the, the Greek uh, uh, figure uh, uh, Medusa, you know, was a was a goddess that that had uh, that had sn uh, snakes for hair. And if you looked at her, you turned into stone. So you obviously don't turn into stone if you look at a jellyfish and it obviously obviously doesn't have snakes for hair. Uh, but it does have these nasty sting, stinging tentacles, and those are all around the mouth, which is inside, 
So kind of like Medusa has a, uh, the Medusa person or, or goddess had a mouth with snakes around it, whereas a jellyfish has a mouth with stinging tentacles around it, which is why it's called a, a Medusa. So what makes uh, a Nidarian different from the other types of, of animals uh, is it has these things known as nidocytes. So these are what actually causes a jellyfish to sting you. Uh, or what might cause other types of, of cnidarians to, to sting you. Uh, and, what a, and how a nidocyte kind of works uh, is, is on the tentacle of a, of a cnidarian, you have millions and millions of these individual cells. Uh, and they have these little hair-like things sticking out, these little triggers that are, that are sticking out of them. Uh, and then you can actually see that on this picture. This is what's known as a fire coral. And so these little hairs sticking out, those are the triggers for their nidocytes. And essentially what happens is if you were to bump into this little trigger, uh, there is this spear-like thing that shoots out of the, this nidocyte. And that spear-like thing will actually embed itself into the skin of, of a prey uh, that it wants to eat, or it will stick into you if you accidentally bump into it. So that is a lot of why brushing up against the, uh, the, the tentacle of a jellyfish is so painful because you have millions and millions of these, of these tiny little hairs uh, getting stuck into you, right? These tiny little uh, uh, spear-like things that get stuck into you. Uh, and just like a, and like a spear, these little nidocytes, their, their little spear thing has a barb. So there are these tiny, sharp little barb-like things that stick into you, you know, which is, of course, really, really uh, unpleasant. Um, you know, myself being a marine biologist, I've obviously had interactions with these. They're not pleasant. Uh, I've gotten stung by fire coral many, many times uh, because they, they tend to grow on lots of surfaces, on coral reefs. And so it's very common to actually act accidentally bump into them and get stung by them. So, uh, so fire corals are relatively benign. It hurts, but it won't kill you. Uh, but there are also nidarians that, in addition to the, the sort of very unpleasant sensation of having millions of these tiny little spears stuck into you, the spears also have venom in them. Uh, and on some uh, cnidarians, the venom can actually be deadly, right? So the venom can shut down your nervous system. So I'll talk about one particular type of cnidarian that does that uh, in a minute. Uh, and by the way, probably a lot of you have maybe heard of this like common folklore about jellyfish stings, that if you pee on it, uh, it will make it better. Uh, the, the science on that is pretty, uh, pretty pseudo sciency, uh, in general, peeing on, uh, on a, on a jellyfish sting is not going to make it any better. Uh, in fact, it will often make it worse, uh, because, uh, a lot of times what, what will happen is if you, if you get stung by a jellyfish and the tentacle is still on you, not all of the nidocytes will have yet fired, right? So some of them will have not yet fired, even though they are on your skin. But in general, what happens when uh, what happens when when uh, a nidocyte comes in contact with fresh water is then it will fire. And RP is basically fresh water. So what can actually happen is if you pee on on say a person's leg that has a tentacle on it, the nidocytes that haven't fired then will fire. So then it makes it even worse. So if you're at the beach, you know, and one of your friends gets stung by a jellyfish, don't pee on them. You know, that's, it's, it's, it's just kind of gross. Uh, so there you go. There's your really important PSA for, for this chapter. Okay, one, uh, one type of cnidarian that I want to focus a little bit in on more uh, is corals. Uh, so what you see here is a coral, and what you see here uh, is what is known as a zooxanthellae. So this big crazy word here, uh, uh, just, just remember that the X is pronounced as a Z. So it's zooxanthellae. Uh, and this zooxanthellae is a type of what's known as a dinoflagellate. So it is a single-celled protist. So remember back in, in chapter 15, we talked about the protist. This is one of those single-celled protists. Uh, and these zooxanthellae, they are endosymbiotic inside of the corals. So endo meaning inside of, and symbiotic meaning having a, a beneficial, a good relationship with them. Uh, and what goes on here? Uh, is that these zooxanthellae are photosynthesizers. So they produce sugars using energy from the sun. Uh, and they live inside of their corals, and you can actually see them there. So that little colorful bit, those are the zooxanthellae. Uh, 
uh, and they give a lot of the sugars that they produce, they give them to the coral host. So they kind of help out the, the coral host. The corals in return uh, provide a nice little home for the zooxanthellae to live in. Uh, so they have this, this symbiotic relationship where they're both kind of helping each other out. Uh, and they do give each other some, some other kind of uh, important things, but the, the main things that are being traded here is that the zooxanthellae make food and give it to the corals, and the corals have this shelter that they give to the zooxanthellae. Uh, and it's this, this very simple exchange of goods uh, that allow coral reefs to, to exist, or at least the, the coral reefs that occur in, in tropical areas like, like Hawaii or the, or the Philippines or, or like Mexico. Right, so those tropical corals that are there, they just wouldn't be able to exist if it wasn't for the, these zooxanthellae that, uh, that, that help them to, to get their food. Uh, so that's one kind of important type of nidarian that I want to focus on. Uh, another one that I want to tell you about that, that will mess you up, one that you don't want to come in contact with are these things. Uh, so this is what's known as an Australian box jellyfish. Uh, and I like to bring these things up uh, because typically when people think of dangers in the ocean, the first thing that they think about is sharks, right? So we're always like, oh, I'm so afraid to go in the water because they're sharks. And because, you know, that scary movie about the Megalodon, that really scared me to go in the water. But in fact, it's sharks are not the things that you should be worrying about in the ocean. Uh, it's, it's jellyfishes. So the Australian box jellyfish, for instance, has been responsible for something like 5,000 deaths in the last uh, 150 years or 140 years, right? So they actually kill way, way more people than, than sharks do, uh, which isn't to say that you should avoid going in the water because of these box jellyfish. In general, the, the most deadly of the jellyfish are, are this one here, and it only occurs in Australia. But even in Australia, there are times of year when, when you do have to watch out for these and times of year when you don't have to watch out for these because they're just not, uh, not really present certain times of year. So, so this is a nidarian that, that you should watch out for. So they have incredibly uh, uh, potent uh, nidocytes that have very potent venom in them. Uh, the venom inside of each one of these things can kill, you know, several dozen humans. Uh, so they've got incredibly potent venom, uh, which is amazing because these things are pretty small. They're only a couple inches long, right? So, so we're talking about a relatively small thing that packs quite, quite a punch. Right, so each one of these box jellyfish has enough venom to kill 60 some odd people, you know, which is crazy. You know, think about how big our class is and then add, you know, then double that class size. And that's how many people can get killed by one single box jellyfish. Okay, the next group that I want to talk about are the mollusks. So mollusks are, are probably my favorite group of, of animals. Uh, mostly because they're so varied and they include a lot of different really interesting things. So mollusks include sea slugs, it includes uh, bivalves, it includes these, uh, it includes snails, and including like uh, like the common garden snail that you might have seen in your garden. Mollusks also include one of my favorite things, octopi, which are which are pretty cool. Octopi and their relatives. They include other types of pretty sea uh, sea slugs. So there's a lot of really, really interesting and really pretty mollusks uh, that are out there. So let's talk about, uh, about, about some of the, the key features of, uh, of mollusks. Right, so all mollusks are bilateral, right? So they've got two sides, a left side and a right side, uh, and they have true tissues uh, inside of them. Right, so you can see in this mollusk, uh, so like the pink stuff is digestive tissue. Uh, the red stuff is kind of respiratory tissue. Uh, they've got kind of mu muscle-like stuff on the bottom, right? So they've got true tissues just like we do. Uh, and they have a left and a right side just like we do, right? So all of the other animals that we're gonna talk about for the rest of this chapter are, are similar to us. So they, they have a left and a right side and they have true tissues. So mollusks, uh, what kind of makes them uh, uh, unique amongst animals is that all mollusks have some version of what's known as a foot. So in the case of a snail, the foot is the part that is on the ground uh, and it is used for locomotion for, for moving around. Uh, for other types of mollusks, that foot is used for attaching to the ground. Uh, for other types of mollusks, that foot has evolved into arms with things like an octopus uh, 
uh, and that's what they use for grasping things and for catching prey and such. So all moths have a foot that they use for attaching to the ground uh, or for moving around. Uh, all moths have a visceral mass. That's this kind of yellowish thing here. So the visceral mass includes all of the really important, uh, 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 all of the important uh, uh, internal organs, right? So it includes like the stomach and the digestive tract. It includes the gills. It includes the heart. That's what that thing is there. It includes the brain. That's what this kind of yellowish thing is right there. So the visceral mass has all of the really important things. Uh, it's kind of like if you if you were to take like our chest cavity and our abdominal cavity and our cranial cavity that has our brain. If you were to put all those cavities together uh, and make it just one thing, that would be a visceral mass that would contain all of our internal organs. Uh, of course, our internal organs are in you know different compartments, uh, but in a mollusk, they're all in one compartment. Uh, and then what kind of holds in all of those really important organs and protects the visceral mass uh, is what's known as a mantle. So the mantle is this kind of purplish thing here. Uh, it surrounds the visceral mass and it protects those organs. Uh, and in some cases, so, so not all mollusks have a shell, but those that do have a shell, it's the mantle that actually produces it. Right, so it, it makes this shell that then adds an extra layer of protection uh, for all of the, these really important uh, internal organs. So I want to talk just really briefly about some of the different groups of, of mollusks. So the first one that we'll talk about are the gastropods. Uh, so these include uh, snails, like, like your common garden snail. Uh, they include slugs. Uh, they include nudibranchs, which are these, uh, these pretty things right here. And they include sea hairs, which are these things right here. So gastropods, uh, what this word means is stomach foot. They essentially have a visceral mass, and that sits on top of their foot. Uh, so they're very, very simple mollusks. Uh, you know, they just have the, their visceral mask and their, their foot. They, they don't have any sort of, um, they don't have a true head like, like other types of mollusks do. Uh, and with these things, some of them have shells, right? So snails typically have shells. Others don't, like nudibranchs in this, uh, in this sea here. Uh, by the way, both of these things you can actually see uh, in Los Angeles. Uh, so at the, the, the rocky beaches in Los, in Los Angeles County, you know, places like Malibu Lagoon uh, State Beach or like Point Doom or, 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 um, or like Leo Carrillo State Beach, you can actually see both of these types of, of, of mollusks uh, there. Uh, in, in, in of the mollusks, gastropods are kind of unique in that some of them do occur on land, uh, whereas some of them occur in the water. Right, so these guys, you know, just occur in water, but there are, of course, many types of snails that are found on land. Okay, another group of mollusks that I want to talk about are the bivalves. So these are probably the most delicious of the mollusks. Uh, and what they actually are includes things like clams, they include oysters, that's what these are right here. So these are oysters in the half shell, you know, which are best eaten raw. They include scallops like this thing over here, and they include uh, mussels. Uh, and what makes them different from the other mollusks is that they all have two hard shells, so two hard valves. And you can see that on this scallop. So up on top here, we have one hard shell, and on the bottom, we have another hard shell. Uh, and of course, the function of those shells is, is to you know, provide some protection to them. You know, on these oysters, you might be looking at them and thinking, oh, they only have one shell. Well, these ones each had two shells, but just the other shell has been removed to make it easier to, to eat them. Uh, and, and the kind of key thing about their lifestyle is that they're sessile, so they attach to the seafloor. Uh, or if they don't attach to the seafloor, they, they just sit on the seafloor. Because as you see, these things, they don't have fins or anything that they can use to move around. Uh, and they are filter feeders. So kind of like the sponges, which I talked about a little while ago. So they, they filter uh, water, right? So they, uh, so they pull in, you know, water, take out the food particles from it and spit it uh, back out. Okay. So those are the bivalves. Okay. The last group of, of mollusks that I wanted to talk about are the cephalopods. So cephalo means head and pod means foot. So these are the types of mollusks that have something kind of like a head. So, so on like this squid, for instance, here is the head right there. So that's where you find the eyes and the mouth. Uh, 
Here is the visceral mass, right? So the, the, that has all of the, the organs inside of it. And this is the foot right here, right? So the arms have evolved uh, or, or the foot has evolved into a set of arms. Uh, encephalopods include squid. They include uh, octopi or octopuses. Uh, they include cuddle fish. Uh, and they include this one very obscure group known as uh, nautilus, uh, which are primarily deep water uh, cephalopods. They don't really, they, it's pretty rare to, to see them because they tend to be found in pretty deep water. Okay, so a little bit about uh, cephalopods. So they tend to be smart, they tend to be fast, they tend to be agile, right? So they're all predators. Uh, and predators in general need to be smart and fast things in order to, to outwit and to catch their prey. Uh, in, with these things, some of them have shells and others don't. So a nautilus has a shell, whereas other cephalopods uh, do not. Uh, in octopi, I want to focus on them a little bit because they do some pretty uh, remarkable things. Uh, octopi... Um, Octopi kind of kind of show us that even though there are so so even organisms that don't have a backbone can still be capable of some pretty smart things, right? So when we tend to think when we think of smart animals, we tend to think of things like dolphins and dogs and bears and things like that. But in fact, there are some invertebrates, so things that don't have backbones, that can do some pretty smart things like octopi, right? So for instance, octopi are capable of social learning. Uh, so it's been found, uh, so, so first of all, what social learning is, uh, it describes learning by watching others, right? So watching uh, another individual perform some task uh, and then figuring out how to do that task simply by watching that other individual. So there have been lab studies where, where scientists have put octopi inside of uh, aquaria uh, and given them tasks to do like a task such as figuring out how to open up a box to get a crab that was inside. Uh, so octopi like to eat crabs. Uh, and it's been found that, that if you put two octopi in tanks right next to each other, uh, and, and one octopi opens you know, a box in order to get at a crab, uh, the octopi in the other tank, by watching that first octopus, uh, will figure out immediately how to open a box with a crab. Right, so they can they can watch other individuals and figure out how to do things by watching others. Uh, and so social learning is something that we more tend to think of as occurring in primates. Right, so we think of things like us humans and monkeys and gorillas as as animals that learn by by watching others. Uh, but in fact, octopi can do it as well. Uh, octopi are also known for for using tools. Uh, so, so there is one particular type of octopus known as a coconut octopus. Uh, they're found in, uh, in the Coral Triangle, places like the Philippines and Indonesia. Uh, and, and what they do is they actually gather coconuts from the seafloor uh, and assemble those coconuts together to make a little home to live inside of. Uh, so you'll actually see these octopi picking up coconuts uh, and walking across the seafloor with them and assembling those coconuts uh, that they can hide inside of. Uh, so this is a, an example of tool use uh, among animals. Uh, and maybe my favorite example of, cephalo of, of octopi smarts has to do with Paul the octopus. Uh, so Paul's uh, owner had a kind of a clever idea. Uh, he would put, uh, during the World Cup, so during the World Cup football or, or soccer match, uh, he, would, uh, he would put uh, two clams inside of Paul's tank, uh, and he would put flags with both of those clams. Uh, and the flags are the, or were of two countries that were playing, you know, on one given day during the World Cup. So, for instance, here Germany was playing Spain, and that's that was the final. Uh, and Paul predicted 11 out of the 13 games successfully. Uh, so he's got a pretty good track record with uh, with predicting uh, World Cup uh, matches. Right. Uh, so that's the cephalopods. Uh, and that's all I've got to tell you about uh, mollusks um, in terms of characters from SpongeBob. Right. So there's kind of two main characters that are mollusks. So Gary the snail is awful, obviously a mollusk. So he's a type of, of gastropod. In uh, Squidward, even though he's called Squidward, I, I think he's actually supposed to be an octopus. So he's a, a type of, of cephalopod. Okay, I want to just spend a, a, a little time talking about flatworms. Uh, 
Uh, so there's kind of three different types of worm groups that we'll talk about. So there are the flat worms, the round worms, and the segmented worms. Uh, and so the flat worms we'll cover first. Uh, these guys are the most simple of the bilateral organisms, right? So of things that have a left and a right side, they're, they're really pretty simple, right? So for instance, when you look at one of these things, you know, they have things that are kind of like eyes that can sense light. Uh, they have a, a stomach that kind of extends throughout their whole body. They do have something kind of like a brain. Uh, and that's pretty much all there is to them, right? They don't even have a, a complete digestive tract like us, right? So by complete digestive tract, I mean that the food goes in one end and it comes out another end, right? So a complete digestive tract means that you have a mouth and you have a butt. But in the case of a flatworm, it has just one entrance. So its mouth is the same thing as its butt, actually. So it has an incomplete digestive tract, right? So a really, really simple uh, way, of, way of being. So these things, you tend to find them in marine areas, you tend to find them in freshwater areas, you find them in like wet, like riparian zones around, uh, you know, around like rivers and lakes and such. So they tend to be found in, in very wet or, or fully wet, uh, fully submerged environments. Uh, and some of them are free living. Uh, so some of them just kind of move around on the, on the, the bottoms of lakes and stuff and, and, and find dead stuff to eat. Uh, but some of them are also parasitic. Right. So you might actually um, you might have heard of a tapeworm. Right. So a tapeworm is, is a type of flatworm. Uh, and some tapeworms can get pretty big inside of humans. Uh, so so some some sleuthing on Google told me that the longest tapeworm ever removed from a human was actually 37 feet long, which is crazy. Right. A worm that's 37 feet long inside of you. Uh, and what that tapeworm was doing, it was essentially eating the food of, of the person that, that it was inside of. So here's another good public service announcement for this chapter. Don't eat tapeworms, right? There has, you know, in the past, there has been kind of dieting uh, 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 fads of consuming tapeworms. Uh, and in fact, if you have tapeworms inside of you, you will lose weight uh, because those tapeworms are stealing your food. But that tapeworm might also kill you. So eating tapeworms in order to lose weight is a really, really bad, a really, really stupid idea. So don't do that. Uh, some, these are some flat worms that are free living, right? So some can be disgusting like tapeworms, but some can be quite pretty like these things. Uh, so these are some flat worms that are found on, on coral reefs. Okay, finally, the last group that we're gonna talk about in, in this uh, part of the chapter uh, are the annelids. So annelids are the segmented worms, right? So the second group of, of worms we'll talk about, right? So we have the flat worms, and then these are the segmented worms. Uh, and they include things like this thing. These are what are known as feather duster worms because they kind of look like feather dusters. Uh, what they do is they kind of stick these kind of frilly uh, uh, feeding appendages out on the water, and they just grab small food particles as they drift by. Same thing with these Christmas tree worms. They're kind of doing the same thing with their frilly sort of gills here. Uh, a fireworm, you know, feels like fire if you touch it because it's got these really sharp little glass-like things, uh, and they are carnivores. So the annelids uh, are characterized by being bilateral with true tissues, like, like all the animals we're going to talk about for the rest of the, of the chapter. Uh, and what makes them different from the other types of worms is that they are segmented. Uh, so their bodies are made of individual units that kind of run the length of their body. So if you look at this fireworm, for instance, you see how there are these kind of yellow lines like running up and down. Those yellow lines are showing us where one segment ends and another segment begins. So in this fireworm, there's a segment right here, and then there's another one here, and then another one here, another one here, and here, and here, and here, and so on and so forth. So there are many, many segments running the length of, of this annelid. Uh, so that's what makes them different from the other worms. So flatworms aren't segmented, and the round worms that we'll cover next are, are not segmented. Uh, and how these things uh, sustain themselves, some are predators, like this, uh, like this fireworm here. Uh, some are deposit feeders, meaning that they eat small bits of food that deposit onto the seafloor. And some are suspension feeders, meaning that they eat small bits of food that are suspended in the water. So in that last slide, I, I showed you a picture of a feather duster worm and of a Christmas tree worm. 
they are suspension feeders. So they eat small bits of food that drift by, that, that drift into them. Right, so there's kind of three different types of, of annelids that I want to talk about. Right, so the earthworms are, are kind of are, are from one major group of the annelids. Uh, they're from a group known as oligochaetes. Uh, then there are the polychaetes, which include mostly marine things. Uh, so that the keat part refers to these hairs. And poly, uh, you might remember, means many. So they've got many of these hairs along them. Uh, and then finally, there are the leeches. So those are the disgusting ones. Uh, so they are ectoparasites. So ecto meaning outside uh, and parasite meaning, you know, parasite. So they parasitize things from the from the outside. Uh, and uh, and there's kind of some there's kind of an interesting anecdote about that or not not anecdote, but maybe a little bit of like history of medicine. So so believe it or not, back in the day, uh, people used to use leeches uh, for medicine. So in the sort of dark days of history of uh, dark days of medicine, uh, it used to be thought that if you were sick, it meant that one of the types of fluid in your body was out of balance. Right. They felt that by having the right balance of blood and bile and phlegm, that that is what was the key to being healthy. Uh, and if you had, say, too much phlegm or too much bile or too much blood, it was a bad thing. And that and that's what would cause you to be sick. So what would what doctors would commonly do is if you were sick with any sort of like sickness, they would actually bring leeches to your house and attach leeches to your body, uh, like around your arms, for instance. And those leeches would suck out some of your blood. Uh, and they thought that that was what would actually make you healthy uh, is by is by getting that blood removed from you because you had too much blood. Uh, of course, we now know that's ridiculous. You know, sicknesses are not caused by having too much blood. You know, having too much blood is not a bad thing. Uh, so so we know that that's not not right anymore. But that's what used to be done, you know, back in the day. OK, so we'll just talk about the, the roundworms and then uh, uh, and then you can learn about the rest of the animals on the in the next part of the Chapter 17 video lecture. So the roundworms, uh, like the others, are bilateral with true tissues. Uh, and what these things do is some are predators, uh, some are parasites. Uh, so, for instance, if you were to eat like a questionable piece of fish, you could end up having a, a roundworm in you. Uh, but the majority of them are decomposers, meaning that they break up dead things. So some of you might remember the episode from SpongeBob where these tiny little worms that ate SpongeBob's pineapple house and were kind of going around Bikini Bottom eating everything, those were roundworms, right? So those roundworms were, were decomposing all of the, the stuff on the, on the sea floor. Uh, and that's pretty much all you need to know about, about roundworms. All right, so in the, the next part of the, of, of the chapter 17 video lecture, we'll, we'll get into the other groups of, of animals. We'll talk about things like crabs and lobsters, and we'll talk about sea stars, and then we'll talk about the things that have backbones like us, like mammals and, and reptiles and birds and, and, and all those fun things.